Hi everyone. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar entitled Green Chemistry Careers in Industry hosted by the GC3. My name is Laura Hoke. I am a technical fellow here at the GC3. This webinar is being hosted in partnership with three really great organizations, uh, NESI, the ACS Green Chemistry Institute, and Beyond Benign's Green Chemistry Commitments. If you're interested in learning more about these organizations, please visit the websites here. So today we have joining us three really great speakers. So we have Irene Erdelmeyer, an organic and medicinal chemist and green chemist and co-founder of Tetrahedron in France. We have Teresa McGrath, an environmental regulatory toxicologist at Valspar, and John Smida, environmental chemist and global sustainability at Steelcase. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn it over to our first presenter, Irene of Tetrahedron. Okay, so I'm really happy to be here with you today. So my aim in this presentation is to convince you that green chemistry is going mainstream and that it is a fantastic opportunity for creativity. Please note that my background is entirely based in the European market and I will talk essentially from the perspective of small companies. So briefly, I will cover the following five topics. After summarizing my education and professional experience, I will shortly introduce Tetrahedron, which then led us to a more general view about green chemistry and R&D-based companies. And of course, we will focus at the end on skills, competences, personal qualities, and potential job profiles for green chemistry careers in industry. I graduated as chemical engineer at the Te Technical University of Darmstadt, which is located in Germany near Frankfurt, and I specialized in synthetic organic chemistry. The logical continuation was then to undertake a PhD, essentially about asymmetric synthesis of prostaglandins and anti-inflammatory compounds, and this in collaboration with a pharmaceutical company. I got very intrigued by the side effects of some pharmacologically active compounds and therefore I went to Paris for a postdoc to learn more about molecular mechanisms of toxicology in the lab of Daniel Monsvi at the CNRS, which is the French research organization. Then I was in the situation as most of you perhaps now, I moved from academy to the business world. My first job in the business world was in a small French biotech called Bioxitech, at that time leader in free radical research and oxidative stress related diseases. There we developed first diagnostics and then did pharmaceutical research on anti-inflammatory compounds for cardiovascular disease. During two years at L'Oreal, I led together with the biologist a project on active biological photoprotection to complement physical photoprotection by UV filters in sunscreen. And from 2002 on, we launched a small contract research organization focused on custom synthesis and medicinal chemistry. During this time, I became more and more influenced by green chemistry, and I just want to highlight some major developments. For example, in 1998, the definition of the 12 principles of green chemistry by Anastase and Warner as a guideline. Very impressive was also the effect of a law introduced in 2001 concerning the use of CMR compounds. Since this date, it is mandatory in France and generally in Europe to follow up annually and quantitatively the use of these toxic compounds for every chemist. So suddenly everybody realized to which extent CMRs were used. In parallel, a controversy started about potential endocrine disrupting activities of UV filters in sunscreen. Then the introduction of REACH, which is the European regulation for chemicals, was an essential step to better protect human health and the environment and introduce for the first time, I think, the precautionary principle. And the MedChem community entered the field in about 2008 when the big pharmaceutical companies such as, for example, GSK and Pfizer 
published the first solvent selection guides. As you can see, very significant evolutions changed at the time, the chemical landscape, and it was against this background that I co-founded together with Jean-Claude Yardin and Marc Moutet Tetrahedron. It is a privately held research and development company which innovates at the interface of chemistry and biology, essentially to provide safe ingredients for the nutrition and cosmetic markets. Our strong commitment to green chemistry is based on three key competences. First, our experience in synthesis allows to move towards greener reactions. Secondly, with a knowledge of medicinal chemistry, we can better evaluate potential hazards and toxicity patterns. And last but not least, with our scale-up know-how, we can develop greener processes. Concretely, that means in terms of products and processes that we work essentially with raw, natural or nature-derived products, such as amino acids, we use water as process solvent whenever possible. And in terms of processes, we develop biomimetic processes which are inspired by the biosynthesis and develop also innovative isolation and purification procedures. So that's given a brief summary of how my career has evolved towards green chemistry. But now I would like to give an overview of how I perceive the green chemistry market for R&D companies. Let us start with a comment from John Warner. The mistake people make is to think that alternatives already exist. He thinks that about 65 to 70 percent of safer alternatives have yet to be invented. Therefore, green chemistry must be a huge engine for growth. In my view, there are three areas of interest in green chemistry. First, safer products. Secondly, safer processes. And finally, matrix and measurements of improvements. Designing and introducing safer chemicals is essential as these chemical ingredients are in the heart of the supply chain for materials and finished products. So I think these chemicals should be safe, active or highly efficient and biodegradable as we have to consider also the end of life of this product. And of course, its functional use should respond to a customer's need. The second important area is the process development. So while the design of safer products is a first step, the next is to find the best way to obtain it. Early in the R&D phase, we still have a high degree of freedom to change and the costs for change are still relatively low. While later on in the scale up, pilot scale and even more in the production scale, usually processes are locked for technological but also for regulatory reasons. So from the beginning on, we have to consider the type of synthesis, the starting material and reagents, for example, can it be renewables, make it sense to be renewables? Also consider the use of solvents and the isolation and purification procedure. Of course, it is important to find with all this a manufacturing mode, which is economically viable. The third area which I mentioned is measurement and metrics. It is absolutely important to measure improvements, for example, by checking against the 12 principles of green chemistry, which are edited here by the American Chemical Society in a pocket guide. If I may take an example from tetrahedron, we could save in the process by introducing a new technology, about 4.5 tons of iron exchange resins and more than 22 tons of solvents and improve several other aspects listed here in the list. So generally, we should not underestimate how important metrics and measurements are. And I think this is going to be a significant source of employment. Obviously, comparing improvements helps to make choices in terms of products and in terms of processes. So just to show a couple of tools which are available first for products, they can be compared, for example, by green screen or alternatives assessment. 
and chemical processes, they can be evaluated either with simple matrix such as the process mass intensity or very complex ones like life cycle analysis or life cycle costing. Currently, there is an international quest ongoing for common matrix so that we could compare really under us the process development. So you see in summary that there are significant evolutions towards queen chemistry and within it. And this has big implications for jobs in this market. So now I will come to skills employers in this field are looking for. Besides sound scientific training, you need a deep understanding of chemical reactivity if you want to design safer products as of course also some knowledge about persistency and toxicology. Here in Europe, uh, the knowledge of the spirit and the logic of which is really a must. And I think something very importantly is also a training in system thinking. Potential job profiles are listed here on the slide. In addition to technical skills, employers are also looking for some personal qualities. So an essential one is of course to be open-minded in particular for cross-sectoral collaborations. It is good to have the desire and the wish to exchange and communicate with other experts and you need to be flexible and curious. For example, don't stick to a good process when you can make it better. And I personally think it's very important to be rigorous in the sense to look for truly relevant improvements. So that concludes my remarks. And if I can just give a summary of the main themes, I'm convinced that a queen chemistry approach is possible and useful in every classical job for chemists. I hope I could convince you to not exclude to work for SMEs. If you are looking for a job in this field, so step back and think about trends. The market for safer products is in constant evolution. Queen chemistry has often the reputation to be expensive or even a luxury, but I think that's wrong. Queen chemistry has to be and can be sound economics. And for your future career, think about continuous professional education. This is key and I personally had the chance to follow some online classes at uh, the University of Berkeley with Rich Engler and Anne Plague, which were really helpful for my R&D work at Tetrahedron. And networking will not only help you to find job, but also accompany you in your work and help to be successful. So the underlying theme was that queen chemistry is going to be mainstream, but if I can leave you with a single thought, then it is this one. The search for safer products and processes is essential for protecting human health and the environment. And even more, it's a fantastic opportunity for you to show your creativity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. That was very insightful. So next up, I'd like to introduce Teresa McGrath of Valspar. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. My name is Teresa McGrath. I represent Valspar, and I'm just going to kick off the next few minutes with a background on who Valspar is and talk about how I landed in this position about two years ago, my path towards green chemistry that landed me here. Then I'm going to talk about what we do here within in Valspar um, that has to do with green chemistry in my position here. And then um, talk about some pointers. You'll hear some overlap with, with what Irene had to say. So she was a nice primer. So thank you, Irene. So at Valspar, well, Valspar is a uh, company based here in Minneapolis. We've been around since 1806. We're headquartered here, but we have offices and manufacturing facilities all over the world. We are a um, paints and coatings manufacturer. And until working here, I had no idea how many types of products require paints and coatings. So I'm learning a lot here on the job. You might know us from products on the shelves of Lowe's or Ace Hardware, where our consumer-facing architectural coatings are found. But in reality, our majority of our products are industrial coatings. 
Um, so we make coatings that go on metal coat surfaces that you might find on building products, exterior buildings, appliances, furniture, automotive coatings. We make wood coatings. We also have businesses that specialize in resin manufacturing and colorant manufacturing. The, the consumer part is, is a smaller part, but the part that I work most closely with is the industrial sectors. You may have heard that we are going to be acquired by Sherwin-Williams, so that won't happen at the beginning of next year, but we are still Valspar, um, so I will be representing Valspar for the purposes of our talk, but in a, in a few months that will change. The merger there will be very interesting because they are much more focused on consumer products. So it actually is a nice combination between the two companies since our focus is on the, the industrial side. So let me talk about um, how I got here, how I landed at Valspar. My undergraduate degree was in bi biology, actually not chemistry, um, at Hamlin University here in St. Paul, Minnesota. So about halfway through my studies there, I decided I really liked chemistry. So I ended up trying to take as many chemistry courses as possible and then ended up with my first position at St. Jude Medical in the analytical lab there. St. Jude Medical is a, is a manufacturer of medical devices also here in St. Paul, Minnesota. I got to work on a lot of interesting things at St. Jude, got to work, it was a small lab, so I got to uh, play with a lot of fun, expensive equipment uh, there, um, but knew that analytical chemistry really wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. At my time in Hamlin, my undergraduate research project was all about bioremediation, so cleaning up pollution after it got into our uh, drinking water. And, and so I liked that project, but I wanted to, um, and I wanted to pursue something similar in, in graduate school. So as I was looking for graduate programs, I was looking around pollution prevention and pollution uh, remediation and stumbled on um, the, the area of green chemistry. So I call this my aha moment, because when I read the principles of green chemistry, they had been out for a number of years already, but when I, I, I first discovered them, in about 2003. So when I read them, they really resonated with me. Um, it made much more sense to prevent pollution from the beginning than to, to clean it up afterwards. And so I decided to pursue a, a graduate degree in, in uh, clean chemical technology from the University of York in the UK. At the time, it was the only master's program that, that focused on green chemistry. Now there's, there's a lot of different programs to choose from here in the States, but, uh, but at the time um, it was the only one. That program still exists at, at York. Um, it is now called a Master's of Research in, in Green Chemistry. But they focused, they did a really great job, I would recommend it to anyone who's looking at graduate programs. They did a really great job of covering all of the principles of green chemistry and engineering in the course. And you also had an opportunity to do a research project. So my research project was uh, synthesizing fragrances and supercritical carbon dioxide using biocatalysis. So you really get hands-on experimentation using the principles of, of green chemistry. Um, so I would really, and I, and I got to play with fragrances for, uh, for a summer, so that was fun too. So I'd recommend it to anyone. During my time at York, I had what I refer to as my lucky networking moment. So you will hear from all three of us that networking is one of the key things that you can do to help further your career and expand your career opportunities. And it's really true. And it's not necessarily my natural instinct to go out there and meet, meet new people. And it, it, can be, it can be tough to put yourself out there, but it really pays off at the end of the day. And my lucky networking moment came when I met uh, Dr. Lauren Hine at a Gordon conference at the end, towards the end of my graduate degree. Lauren Hine is, from the moment I sat down next to her, um, we, we hit it off. And she, at the time, was the director of applied sciences at Green Blue. Her resume is much bigger than, than what I have up here. But, um, but when I met her, she was, was at Green Blue. And now she is the executive director of the Northwest Green Chemistry Institute, where they work with with folks who are developing new innovative green chemistry solutions. She was really my mentor. She is my friend and she has been, she's the first person I turned to for career advice. 
I handed her my resume and she was able to, to help me with my first job, which was my first job out of um, graduate school, which was at the EPA. So I worked for, spent two years at the headquarters in DC working with the EPA's Design for the Environment group and the um, Green Chemistry Program. So I worked with chemical manufacturers to help them choose safer ingredients for their products. At the time, um, I was moving back to Minnesota. They were outsourcing the program to a not-for-profit organization called NSF International. They are based in, in Michigan. I helped with that transition and then ended up staying on with them running the program and the Green Chemistry Program and leading a team of toxicologists to support the Design for the Environment reviews that we did there and, and a number of other programs. But still working with chemical manufacturers, product manufacturers, and helping them to design um, with using safer materials. After about 10 years of doing the similar work, I decided you know, I, was, I was ready for, for a new challenge, ready to try something else. And it was actually a connection from my days at the EPA, who I knew, um, and someone who I continued to, to run into at green chemistry and engineering events, Bob Israel, who was my connection to Valspar. So he is our VP of, of global product stewardship here, and he created this new position as a toxicologist to support our chemicals management, and it was, a, it was a great fit for me and has been, been a really fun, fun job so far. So here at Valspar, Bob Israel had, before my time here, I've been here for about two years, had created these, our corporate sustainability program, and it really centers around these five pillars of sustainability. I'm not going to go through all of these, because you can, you can go to our website and read more about these. Um, but really where my work focuses is on the innovation pillar. Um, and within innovation, what we encourage our, all of our global businesses to do is to focus on the development of, of better performing coatings that use safer materials and reduce emissions uh, while minimizing waste throughout the product life cycle. That's really the cool stuff that I get to work on. And I'll go through that in a little more detail in the le next slide. So my, my job is to implement our global chemicals management plan where I work with all of our different businesses um, to focus on the continuous improvement of our material selection. So, so what that means practically is that I look at the tens of thousands of different chemicals that we use all uh, throughout our businesses and identify and prioritize those chemicals that we want to remove first. And then I work with our chemists, our chemists and our business leaders to identify the best alternatives to use for those materials. Now, I'm just one person, so I uh, can't help do all of the alternative assessments that, that need to be done within our business. So also part of my job is educating our chemists and our engineers and giving them the tools to do those hazard assessments for themselves. So that's, that's another part, part of my uh, job is that education and outreach. The other side of my job is to improve transparency within our global businesses. So our customers are thirsty for additional information on the products that they're buying from us. They want to be able to be empowered to make their own safer material selection. And to do that, they need to see, um, see behind the curtain. And so what I'm doing is working with our different global businesses and identifying and establishing the policies that we can use to better communicate information about our products to our customers. And again, largely that's a business to business communication. But part of that, through that we need to engage with stakeholders, both within our customer base, but, but within our supply base as well. And we need to know what's going into our products to be able to to communicate that to our downstream users. So that's facilitating that and flow of information is, is another big part of my job. I want to leave you with the last two slides with some ideas on where to look when you're looking for a new job. Really, I want you to, to think about expanding the universe of jobs that you might be looking for. Um, green chemistry jobs really can be found anywhere. So I have myself have worked in government and for an NGO, for um, now industry, but you can um, find these positions that help promote green chemistry and promote the use of safer materials and safer 
um, manufacturing processes in many different sectors. Um, I've listed a few here. This is certainly not comprehensive, but you can influence these policies from even from a retailer standpoint, where you know you'd think of those uh, retailers. Um, as being pretty far removed from chemical manufacturing, but um, those are our end customers sometimes, and those folks can, can influence our material selection by their purchasing policies. I also encourage you to look at different types of positions. The, the natural place to look is, of course, a bench chemist, but you really can use your chemistry and technical expertise in many different areas. Myself, I'm a toxicologist by title, but in reality, you know, lots of my position, my job is working with allies within my company and without, with allies with other stakeholder communities to communicate why green chemistry is important to implement within our organization. So that being the case, you can really do that from a lot of different positions. Even our sales team has a lot of opportunities to influence what our products end up using in our formulation. And finally, leave you with a few pieces of advice. One is to find what motivates you, find what your interest area is, and really dive in. Become an expert in that area, and, and that will open up opportunities for you professionally. Network, as well as I said before, networking is, is key and can widen your, your, your opportunities as well. Maintain good relationships through your university, through your first job. Um, you never know when you might run into folks again and, and, and rely on those relationships for future positions. The last two billets are really more about how do you influence green chemistry um, within your organization once you do land a position. One is to know your audience, know what motivates other folks within your organization. Oftentimes it won't be because of sustainability or green chemistry. Oftentimes you'll, you'll need to translate the motivation into dollars and cents. So really know who you're talking to and what will, will motivate them and influence them to change. And finally, look for allies everywhere within your organization and within your stakeholder base. You never know when you might find um, a relationship that will help you with your internal green chemistry goals. That might be a, um, a marketing person within your organization, or it might be an NGO who has traditionally attacked your industry that you find an opportunity to collaborate with. Um, you never know where those alleys might be, and, and they can, um, organizations like the Green Chemistry um, and Commerce Council are great at fostering those types of relationships. So that's, that's where I'll leave you, so I'll pass it off, off to John. Thank you so much, Teresa. That was a great presentation. So with that, I will turn the controls over to our last speaker, John from Steelcase. Hi, everybody. I'm John Schmea. I am a leader in sustainable design and development at Steelcase. Uh, we're a global office furniture manufacturing company based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. You know, the, those are two tough acts to follow, but I'll try to add some pieces of wisdom if possible. You'll notice my, my first slide here has some clip art. That's, you'll, you'll notice that throughout my presentation. But basically, what, what the goal is, right, is to graduate and find a job and hopefully not go back. And so hopefully some of the things we're telling you today will, will help you guys that as you, as you set out on your career paths. So just real quickly on, on my story, you know, I say from a small town farmer to a small town sustainability leader and everything in between. Basically, I graduated from high school in a town of 8,000 people in Minnesota in 2001 and went to the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul with the goal of becoming an orthopedic surgeon. I quickly discovered that I did not like biology very much, sorry, Irene, and that I was, I was more... I was more excited about the chemistry, and that started me down the path towards pharmacy school. Then I got a job in a pharmacy and realized very quickly that I didn't think I would like to do that my whole life, but I was already a senior, and I was, I was on the, the chemistry path, and I said, okay, now, now what do I do? So I took a year off and went to graduate school. I was lucky enough to get into UC San Diego, spent six or five and a half great years there studying homogeneous catalysis, trying to convert carbon dioxide to liquid fuels uh, to, to hopefully close, the, close the, the liquid fuel loop that we're currently not closing um, and releasing our carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And when I left there, 
I had gained a very strong interest in sustainability, especially as it related to renewable energy uh, and climate change. And what I'll say is that I didn't have any, any training, any real knowledge whatsoever in green chemistry or toxicology. And so what I was trying to do with my chemistry degree and my research background was to leverage that into a career in renewable energy and climate change. And it turns out that's not incredibly easy. Most companies I applied or most NGOs or government agencies I applied for, for jobs in that field were, were, they would reply and say, well, you're, you're a chemist. I don't know why I would hire you for this position. And I would say, well, I, I don't want to do chemistry anymore. I don't want to work in a lab anymore. And this, this seems logical. And they didn't seem to think so. So after I graduated from with my PhD, uh, I had some struggles and we'll talk about those a little bit as we go. But like Irene and Teresa both said, networking was very important to me. And I, I ended up talking to a person who I now consider to be one of my mentors, Brian Pantella at, in Washington. And he, I connected with him through a variety of different people. And he said, listen, you're a chemist. He's like, why not get a job in in green chemistry or materials chemistry and sustainability at some company. And I, I, I had a fairly ridiculous answer. I said, well, I'm not really that interested in chemistry. And he, he sort of argued that, that I must be if I spent six years in graduate school studying it. And he suggested I go to a conference in Chicago uh, on green chemistry. And one thing I'll tell you about networking is that when you're a student and you're looking for a job, there may be more opportunities to go to conferences for free or very cheap than you might think. It's worth contacting the organizers and asking them if they have any volunteer spots for attendance or if they're willing to let a, a poor student or a poor graduate go um, to their conference for free or very cheap. And that's how I ended up meeting somebody from Steelcase. I just happened to sit down at a table next to someone uh, in the morning of the second day started chatting. They said, hey, we have a job for a chemist, I think, open in our sustainability group. You should hand me your resume. Uh, next thing I knew, I was moving to Grand Rapids, Michigan, basically sight unseen. And I've been with Steelcase ever since. Luckily for me, after about two and a half years in that, that position, I was given the opportunity to work remotely. Uh, so moved back to Minnesota, uh, where I'm originally from. And now I actually not only work in green chemistry and sustainability, but get to do it from my own house and there's no commute involved, so that's great. And I, I sort of, you know, I have bullet points here, but really the important parts are the spaces between those bullet points where, where decisions had to be made, or in some cases, decisions were made for me that guided me to where I was. And I, I think maybe you're not gonna know early on in your educational career what you wanna do when you grow up, but it's worth having a broad base of knowledge to leave school with so that you're marketable and that you can you can talk intelligently about a lot of different subjects. And that's one of the things that I think I would stress, especially if you're going to graduate school in chemistry or chemical engineering or any of those fields, is don't don't limit yourself to the one very specific topic that you need to study for your research. Um, while that's important to become an expert, it's also important to to learn a little bit of other things. So Steelcase, uh, in a nutshell, founded in 1912. Uh, now we're a global company. We operate basically everywhere except Antarctica. We have more than 9,000 employees globally, and we provide pretty much everything you can think of furniture-wise that goes into an office. Chairs, desks, wall systems, some technology products. We actually have a what I would consider a really strong history of sustainability. And I say it dates back to some of the founders. Um, actually, the first product that Steelcase ever made before it was even called Steelcase was a metal wastebasket. And the reason that that metal wastebasket was developed is it was, you know, the early 1900s and everybody was smoking in the office and they would throw their, their cigarette butts into wicker wastebaskets. And you can imagine that didn't go well a lot of times. And so we developed a... a steel wastebasket to try to save people and buildings from burning down in cigarette fires. And that, you know, that history is sort of traced all the way through up to 2004 when we certified the first ever product to the cradle to cradle standard. We've been working really hard in the green chemistry space since 2004 when we really, when we really started down that path. Um, we have what I would consider a fairly large sustainability team as well as 
the most important part of our sustainability team, which is advocates throughout the company in supply chain and marketing and engineering and design that really think about sustainability on a day-to-day -day basis and try to implement it in their own jobs. We also have support from the top at our company. Our CEO recognizes that we're in the people business and that sustainability plays a vital role in supporting people. You see here, it's, it's about creating the economic, social, and environmental conditions that allow people to, to thrive. And we see it as a systems approach. You can't really look at it narrowly as environmental or human health or social impact. You have to look at the whole picture and how your products can impact those things throughout their life cycle. Our areas of focus in product sustainability are really in toxicity, consumption, and waste. I came into Steelcase as our environmental chemist and our material chemistry group. And we've heard, you know, from Irene, who is working on chemical processes and actually developing chemicals. We've heard from Teresa, who is a formulator. This really doesn't do either of those things. We buy materials from suppliers. Uh, actually, Valspar is a supplier of ours um, for some of our coding technologies. So we buy materials from suppliers, and therefore, we not only have to rely on our relationships with them to find out what's in those products, what might be hazardous or problematic within the materials we're buying, but also towards innovation. We need to really have a strong connection with our supply chain. So while I'm a chemist and, you know, most of the jokes about chemists are that when you're having a conversation with them, they look at their feet, not even yours. I have to be, I have to be open to talking to people I've never met before, open to talking to audiences that aren't necessarily technical from a toxicology and chemistry standpoint, and open to really, like Teresa said, really meeting people where they are and finding out how to influence their decisions based on the things they're interested in and not the things I'm interested in. So, so it's a really, really interesting space to be in, especially coming directly out of graduate school where everything is super focused and very, very technical. So when I joined Steelcase, like I mentioned, I didn't have any green chemistry training. I didn't have any toxicology training. So it was really on the job training. You know, before I even started there, my, my manager sent me a link to buy toxicology for non-toxicologists, which is a really good primer to just learning some of the basics, some of the terminology. From that, I, you know, you take a lot of notes, you read a lot of things online, hopefully, hopefully from reputable sources, and you really just try to learn the field that you're expected to become an expert in. I was lucky enough last year, along with Teresa, actually, to participate in the Green Screen Practitioner Program to become a certified Green Screen Hazard Assessor, and that you know, while I don't use it every day to do green screen assessments on chemis chemicals in our products, um, it's a great framework for thinking about toxicity and human and environmental health impacts. And, you know, when I first started at Steelcase, and even now, you know, you kind of have to be that annoying guy on the bus or next to you on the plane that asks questions and tries to learn at all points. And that, you know, that's, that applies whether you're good at it or not. I think networking is a, is a skill that can be learned and I think we have to practice it. And, you know, Irene said it can be fun. Uh, for somebody like me, it's generally not fun, but I'm getting more comfortable with it as time goes by. And it can really open doors for you, whether it be getting a job, moving up in your job, or just being more successful in your job. So networking is important. So the things that I wish I would have known when I was in your position, one, you know, learn toxicology and green chemistry if you have the chance. Whether it's a bachelor's program, a master's program, or a PhD program, we get so focused on exactly what we have to learn to become an expert that sometimes we don't take off the blinders and look at what else is available to us. And green chemistry as, as coursework, as a, as a, a full line of, of education, is growing and it's expanding. And there are a lot of opportunities out there beyond just the academic classroom to learn it. And toxicology, while chemists aren't required to learn it in most schools, I, I think it should be a requirement. And I think it's, it's worth trying to become an expert or at least have a working knowledge of as many of those things as you can. When you do get into your job search, don't avoid large companies. I will tell you as somebody who applied for 105 jobs before I found one, that avoiding large companies can really limit your opportunities. There are multiple reasons to not avoid them. One, large companies have the resources to hire people like us. Two, large companies 
tend to have a big impact. I applied for some jobs at Apple, despite never using any Apple products in my daily life. And somebody asked me why, and I said, listen, they have a $300 billion a year impact on the economy. If we can make even small changes in the safety and human and environmental health impacts of their products, that makes a huge change globally. So really don't avoid companies like that. And, you know, you do have to talk to people. I'm sorry if, if you don't like networking, but it's, it's really the most important, important part of finding a job, keeping a job, and being successful in a job. So... Obviously, we're all trying to get to a payday, but hopefully more and more can really start to have an impact on the globe, on the people, and, and the environment that we rely on as we find those jobs. And yeah, we have a little bit of time for questions, I hope. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. That was also a really great presentation. So the first question is for Irene, um, but I think anyone could actually answer this question. So Irene, you mentioned that the knowledge of regulations such as REACH or uh, systems level thinking in general is essential. So where can students or early career scientists learn this? In fact, in Europe, there's the agency which is concerned about this regulation and they have re really nice uh, documents. Uh, you can download them. They have for all regulations always short description on one page, which, which is called, uh, for example, REACH in a nutshell for products or for formulations, then you can have a little bit uh, a wider document with about 10 or 20 uh, pages. So you can gradually, gradually go inside it and, and learn about it. And I think also there are some universities which give some online courses about this. I know that in Germany there is a university which is called Lefana University who give some courses. I'm not sure if it's always online, but I think it is possible to find uh, online courses and also um, webinars from the European Chemical Agency about, in particular, of course, about which. Thank you. John or Teresa, do you have anything to add? In my course at University of York, did we had an entire section that was devoted to policy, so I'm glad that Irene's presentation touched on how policy influences the green chemistry community, and I'm not sure if that if there's an updated version of that in the current course, but I'd just uh, like to add that not only does regulations now drive green chemistry decisions within companies, but more and more larger organizations like Google or, or retailers like Walmart and Target um, are setting policies within their organizations that are almost de facto regulations at some point. Those could need to be factored into the equation as well. Okay, great. Thank you. So our next question, can you speak a little about opportunities with NGOs relating to green chemistry? This was alluded to, but I would like to know a little more if you have any information. So uh, NSF International, who I worked for for nine years, um, is an NGO. By tax status, they are NGO. They're not like an ad advocacy necessarily NGO, but they do work for non in a non for profit platform. And so there's they are a third party certifier and accreditation body. So most of the work goes around certifying products against certain regulatory or safety standards. And within that platform, there are a series of sustainability standards that incorporate a number of principles of green chemistry within them. And so that's where, that's what I supported as part of our toxicology team and our green chemistry team. There are other similar certification, third-party certifying bodies in the NGO space, but there's also a number of advocacy groups that work closely with industry to help promote the use of safer materials and promote uh, reducing life cycle impacts. I'm not sure if I can name even a fraction of them, but a couple that come, come to mind are Clean Production Action, who works with the, um, who was the developer of the green screen methodology that, that John referred to and that I work with on maybe a weekly basis, not necessarily a daily basis, which is a way to, to review the hazards associated with chemicals. Another is the Environmental Defense Fund that works with larger corporations to develop policy, 
internal company policies to reduce the impacts of those organizations. So those are just a couple of examples, certainly not even at the tip of the iceberg there. Great. Okay. Anything to add, John or Irene? Yeah, this is John. I'll just add really quickly that I think when it comes to trying to get a job at an NGO, I think the the networking side of things is going to be even more important because they tend to be small organizations or very focused groups within larger organizations on things like green chemistry. It's definitely important to meet those people in person, shake hands, introduce yourself, and express your interest rather than just being sort of a, a face in the crowd. So that's the one thing I would add. Yes, and I could perhaps just add from the European side some other NGOs which are really good. Uh, for example, Chemsec, which is working a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Another one is European Environmental Agency and also the Green Chemistry Network, which was uh, started at York, I think. Great, thank you. I, I actually have a, a follow-up question. So how did you succeed in convincing someone from a company or from an NGO to hire you for a green chemistry job if you don't have a background in toxicology or alternative assessments or other training that would necessarily sort of peg you as a green chemist? I'll start because that's exactly where I was. I think, you know, really stressing the ability to learn and the sort of research background that comes with, with the background in chemistry is important. I know that that was one of the selling points uh, for Steelcase when they hired me was that I, I had the ability to learn new things and really dig in and become an expert on a topic. So stressing that, the importance of that, and also, you know, do a little bit of research before you go into these networking situations or even applying for jobs to see what the company or the NGO is interested in. For me, you know, Steelcase does a lot with Cradle to Cradle. So reading the original book on cradle to cradle design was an important point for me, just so I had that knowledge, the language they were using, what they were talking about, what they were thinking about. So I think doing a little research and expressing that interest in and success in research can be an important point, even if you don't have the actual direct experience. Yeah, this is Teresa. I would 100% back what John just said and only add that you also want to be able to connect to somebody on a personal level as much as, as you can. So I think the research, researching your organization is probably the biggest, the biggest thing. But if you are, if, if you are in the situation of, of, you know, coming up to someone cold in a networking situation or, or presenting your resume cold in, in a, to a job, put some personal details in there. They want to want to, to work with you. Um, they want to like you from a personal standpoint. So putting in some details, you never know when, you know, a personal experience of yours or interest of yours might connect with the person who's reading your resume, um, whether it's gardening or running or, or some, some other hobby that shows, you know, makes the resume more personable and might be that, that foot in the door. So our next question for Teresa and John. So what do the green chemistry teams at Steelcase and Valspar look like? Large, small, mostly chemists, mostly non-chemists, et cetera. <laughs> That's a funny question. We don't really have a green chemistry team, so it might just be me. We do have a product safety team, however, and that's, there's, there's five of us within the product safety team. I'm the, the, there's one other toxicologist within my team and then another toxicologist that lives in a different branch of the organization. So we're the only technical folks and all of us were hired within the last five years. So uh, having this capability is rather new to Valspar in general. The rest of my team has more of a chemistry background and does a lot of more focused on regulatory aspects. So I'm really the only team member who's more focused on proactive implementation of safer materials selection. With that said, I've tried to find uh, other folks within the organization who hold different titles, but who can help me with this within each business. And like I said, I never know where I might find those allies and those extended team members, but they are, have the challenge of finding who, who that person is. So really, to answer your question, just, just a team of, of one at the moment. <laughs> 
Yeah, and uh, I'll add at Steelcase, our, our sustainability work in general is um, a little bit confusing to understand how it's organized. Uh, we have a global sustainability team. We have our sustainable design and development group. Currently, I'm the only chemist. We have several chemical engineers on our team. We do have another chemist toxicologist in our in a different group that focuses on different aspects of sustainability. So depending on the company, there's going to be, a, I guess what I can say is there's going to be a lot of differences in how things are organized. And it's, it's worth if you can't learn that before you apply at a company, it's worth asking that question in the interview because it shows that you're thinking about the different ways that these things can be organized and the different, you know, um, sort of corporate politics at play. I would say, you know, I remember Teresa had a list of different places within organizations that you might find jobs of interest. One other one, well, actually two other ones that I would add, I didn't see a, an actual sustainability group on that list. Some larger companies do have corporate sustainability groups that might have positions. And then the other one I would add is in supply chain. So a company like Steelcase has a fairly large supply chain group. I would personally love it if we had more people interested in green chemistry and sustainability within that group. Great, thank you. So this next question is for Irene. So Irene, you mentioned understanding market trends is really important. So do you have any suggestions of where some, a student or early career scientist might look for these trends to try to understand where job opportunities are? Yes, I think concretely on the GC3 website, uh, there are currently some discussions about problems which need to be solved. For example, uh, a big problem for the cosmetics industry, for example, preservatives. Another problem is, I think, plasticizers for the plastic industry to substitute BPA. And I think also that cradle to cradle institution uh, has a list of problems which need to be solved. So I think this can indicate in which area there are still a lot of problems and so in which area um, you could apply uh, to, to find a job and to help to improve and to innovate uh, to, to find uh, these better products. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, did you feel you had to go back to school and get your degree from the University of York to move into the green chemistry field and shift your career? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, I did. I did feel that was um, necessary. Um, and the my, my undergraduate degree was in biology, so um, I had taken a lot of chemistry, but needed. I felt like I needed additional experience and education in chemistry. And having a master's degree, even by so, some jobs, just um, require require masters or PhD level degrees, and so that also I think expanded my opportunities, or that's one of the reasons I went. Benefits that I saw from that I actually saw from having the degree was more with the, the connections that it built for me, and certainly the education was great too. But the connections were the most valuable piece of that decision. I think that every job that I got after graduate school have, have all been through people I know through networking. Thank you. So this next question is regarding green chemistry opportunities in Canada. So the, the questioner wants to know, are most operations based in North America based out of the USA? Do you know of any Canadian-based companies or organizations with a focus in this area? This is, this is John. I can't think of them off the top of my head, maybe somebody else can, but I know there's been groups from Canada, both corporations and NGOs and government agencies at some of the conferences I've been at, and I would be happy to find them and share them if I can. Yeah, I think there's one called Green Chemistry Center with an RE. <laughs> I think that's what it's called, but that's in, in Canada that does basically help develop new companies that are, uh, that have green chemistry solutions. So they help scale up those organizations. I, yeah, I think it's called Green Chemistry Center or Center Green Chemistry Canada or something like that. Yeah, that sounds familiar. I'm actually going to chime in here because I did my PhD at the University of Toronto in Canada. So the organization you're talking about is called Green Center Canada. They're really awesome. They're a great organization. So they're basically an incubator that helps to uh, facilitate 
getting green chemistry innovation into the market. So if you're looking in terms of opportunities in Canada, they'd be a really great place to start. There are a lot of other really good things happening. I think a lot, like the Canadian government in general is very supportive of green chemistry. Green Center would be a really good bet. So if you have more questions, you can let us know and maybe I can help as well. Okay, and I actually think that is it for our questions. So with that, I'd really like to thank the speakers again for their time and I'd like to thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you.